the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. My name is Hattie Akvik. I'm 17 years old and a senior in high school. My parents came over to the U.S. about 24 years ago from Syria. Ever since the Syrian crisis started, my parents have been very involved, especially my dad. He started a non-profit organization that goes on medical and humanitarian missions to many refugee camps in Jordan. This organization is called Atlantic Humanitarian Relief, and this summer was the first time I could go. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers, I'm Dan Hurley. About three weeks ago, I read a Facebook post by a friend, Dania Karam, uh, that stopped me in my tracks. Dania and her family had just returned from a medical and humanitarian mission trip to Jordan to assist some of the 600,000 Syrians now living in refugee camps in that country. The, re the refrain in the post was, I have no words. Fortunately, Dania has many words, if not enough answers to the questions her experience left her pondering. On the trip, her family joined others, some doctors, some high school and college aged children, one young man, Hadi Akbik, uh, captured video and photos that made the indescribable somewhat understandable. The final line of the post was, I have no words. I will never be able to unsee. As soon as I read that post, I knew I wanted them on Newsmakers. I am joined this morning by Dania Karam and uh, this was her first trip to the refugee camps in Jordan. Her husband was a member of the medical team. She and her two adult children uh, served on the humanitarian team. Ms. Karam uh, is a financial advisor with her own firm, Brilliant Advice. Dr. And I'm not going to get all these names right. Hugh Mom Akbik, mm -hmm. is that yes, close sir. enough? That's, that's all perfect. Right. Uh, is the founder and chair of the Atlantic Humanitarian Relief. He is a Harvard trained and nationally ranked anesthesiologist and pain management specialist. Since 2011, he has led numerous medical and humanitarian missions to Jordan. And then his son, Hadi uh, Akbik, is a, uh, the doctor's son. He's 17 years old and just started his senior year at Moeller High School. He is a producer of the video you will see clips from this morning. His uh, mother and college-age sister were also members of the humanitarian team that went on this trip. Welcome to Newsmakers, all of you, and um, I just start out saying congratulations for the work that you did on this trip and the work that you are doing on an ongoing basis. Um, Daniel, the, the, clearly this really impacted you. What are some of the strongest sort of images that you came back with? There's so many and um, as, you, as you said, I, I, I'm caught between having no words and having too many words. So I guess what I will say to you is, um, you know, we're, we're all trying to be globally aware, but until you actually are on the ground and see it, you can't understand the circumstances and the conditions that these people are living in. When we drove up our bus up to the first camp that we visited. And we have several, by the way, still shots of some of the camps which we'll mm -hmm. be dropping in here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I could not get over the landscape. It was so unbelievably desolate. I put it in my post and I said it as, I, um, as we approached the camp is, the moon is more hospitable. It was so dry. It was a, over 100 degrees of heat that day. There's nothing green. You have rows and rows and rows of these white, what we thought were tents, but are actually, I call them containers. They're metal structures that people are living in. As we approached it, it, it you just, you, you couldn't even comprehend what you were seeing, that people could even exist there. And then as we got in there and we saw the living conditions, um, it, was, it, was, it was really, really tough. People are just walking around aimlessly. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's indescribable. And some of these camps have 30,000 people living in them. This, they're, they're not small places. They, exactly. Yes, the first, there, there's, the way um, uh, the camps are structured in Jordan, but, but, but uh, at the beginning, first of all, thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you for allowing us 
to bring more awareness to this. I, I'm very humbled by my presence here with you oh. and you bringing this, uh, this um, matter to the attention of many people here in Cincinnati and hopefully nationwide. The way the uh, refugee camp structured, in, when the crisis started in Syria, the flood of refugees start going to the neighboring countries. Nobody uh, expected that would be so many people going through the borders. At one point, there was about 1.2 to 1.6 million people in Jordan. Jordan um, is a small country, doesn't have the capacity to be able and uh, to host so many people in such short period of time. Resources are extremely stretched. And I could really um, imagine the pressure that that the government of Jordan was under to be able to host so many people. So the urgency came to create some camps. So there was a few types of camp. The first camp was opened was Al Zatari camp. And that was supposed to be a um, small camp that, that hopefully the crisis will end soon, but then start to expand. To one point, there was about 140,000 people in that camp. And that's built within one year. So you can imagine what's the, the, the circumstances were there. Then, right now, there's about 85,000, but during that period of expansion, another camp was built up, and that was called Al-Azraq camp. And that capacity, uh, over 100,000, but that, right now there's about 53,000. And then you have a third camp that's sponsored by the Emiratis, and then you have what we call random camps. And then you have people who goes and rent houses in the, in the city. So basically, that's how the whole of so close to a million spread out spread in lots out. of different uh, settings yeah, and settings. situations. That is correct. As a 17 year old, now your father's been very involved in this for years. Mm -hmm. So you've heard a lot. Yeah. What was your reaction to what you were experiencing? Well, it, it was kind of um, like years building up to it. You know, he's been doing it for a long time. And, um, you know, we were all, like, really excited to go for the first time. Um, but it was, it was way different than I thought it would be. Um, like, it, basically, we kind of just jumped into it. So the first day we went to those random camps, we met, like, I met these, uh, like, these two boys. But they were both 15, and they, they were telling me how, like, they work in the strawberry farm. And I was like, well, how long do you work? He's like, well, usually we work maybe 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day. And I was like, well, do you go to school? He said, yeah, but work, you know, work is the first priority because if we don't work, we're not allowed to live in this camp. And then, like, from there on, um, everything I saw was kind of unexpected. You know, I didn't, I couldn't imagine, like, their living situations. You see these, you know, tin houses that were shown, and they're, they're 27 meters and six people live in there, you know? There's, we, we have a clip from your video of, there's no narration here, this is just, shots of children, some probably not that much younger than you, mm -hmm. that really struck me uh, very hard when I saw it. I, I, and it seems to me um, there's the medical side, which we're going to talk about in a, minute, in a minute, but the humanitarian side of just reaching out to people and letting them know that somebody cares, um, it, it seems to me really powerful. Mm -hmm. it, it, and that's that's what the two of you we yeah. were really involved with, right? I mean, uh, like these kids, the, the first day we went, um, like we, we brought them some soccer balls and the, like, the sheer excitement on their faces like, for like, just a simple thing, because they never get them. So usually like, they'll have one ball and they'll all just fight over it. So we brought them these like, supplies, we brought them things for their faces, like some coloring books, and you just see hundreds of kids just flock to you because they, they, they don't get to see these things a lot, you know? And um, like the, the little things, you know, like we, we brought them like little noses, like little clown noses and that entertained them for hours. So <laughs> it, it was like really great to watch. Yeah. Um, from a, the humanitarian side of this, there was also a focus on education. Mm -hmm. And I saw that <clears throat> You know, there are a number of stills of you know, d different people engaged with the children. W what's the ability to keep children's education going at all in this situation? It's really tough. The camps provide education, but many of the kids in the camps don't go to school. 
they don't go for a variety of reasons. Uh, if you think about the trauma of war, their parents oftentimes aren't able to deal with the day-to-day -day stresses so that they can't then promote their kids to go to school. So you have to have healthy parents who can then encourage their kids and get their kids to the schools, and that's not the case. And there are a lot of people that are really psychologically struggling with the loss of home, the loss of loved ones, the loss of very close family members, and the displacement. I think um, I, I read something that there are 2.5 million kids, Syrian children, who have been displaced by the war. And they are outside of Syria. Mm -hmm. That would equate to 35,000 school buses that would be required to bring them back to Syria. That's a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And about a third of them are not getting any education at all. Yeah. Um, mentioned by your son right away in the, that, what the, the clip we heard that um, you're from Syria. Mm -hmm about 24 years ago yes. came to the United States. Do you still have family in Syria? Yes, my mother, my sister, my brother, my nieces are still living in Syria. My, my other brother is a refugee in England, so our, my own immediate family is also dispersed and, and, uh, and we are all over the place. And um, what's your ability to stay in touch with your mother and the relatives still in Syria and, you know, and their ability to maintain some normalcy in their life? Well, I, I mean, the, the new, always, it's the situation that they live in become the new norm. And for us, it's always not, not normal, but when they live in and that's the day in, day out, that's become the new norm. Our communication is based on the availability of electricity and internet at the same time. So you have to have the electricity, they have it every few hours a day, and then the internet in between those few hours. So you have just to catch that moment where you're able to communicate with them. That's the only mean of communication. Uh, with my family. So there's days that you won't be able to because there's just that moment uh, does, not, uh, does not exist. You know, we've talked a little bit about the humanitarian side of this, but as a doctor, it's the medical side that I suspect really drives you and your husband. And so give us a little sense of, you know, how many doctors went on this particular trip and what were you facing as you went on this trip? This trip, a total of participants were about 257 people. And there was about 108 uh, people from all around the world. Um, US, Germany, Sweden, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, everywhere. And all of them, don't know each other. It's all Facebook movement. So we, the first time we eat, we meet each other was on a Saturday in the hotel in the morning of the starting of the mission. And then we had a partnership with um, a very generous uh, uh, organization called Al Musa organization that was in as well in Saudi Arabia. And there they came with us and we were able to have a full surgical team and a full medical team. Our missions breaks into multiple arms. You have a humanitarian arm, and then you have dental arm, you have medical arm, and you have surgical arm. Mm -hmm. So the surgical arm, there were, we have multiple specialties. We had general surgery, we had ophthalmology, uh, OBGYN, uh, we had neurosurgery. Uh, we had neurosurgery? Mm -hmm. And we had orthopedic surgery. Wow. So we were able to do variety of surgeries. We had over, uh, in the in the in the in the week that we have done, we had over about two thousand people that were screened. We were able to do about one hundred and seven surgeries. Our surgical team uh, worked literally from seven a.m. until one or two a.m. and they went back to the hospital seven a.m. the next day. Mm -hmm. That's for seven seven days in a row, and that's how we're able to get those surgeries. Of course. The surgery, the hospitals are not equipped like the U.S., so you have to make the best of it. And they did a phenomenal job working with what they had 
and to be able to have all the surgeries done. Some of them were emergency surgeries, like Dr. Karam, Dania's husband, were able to perform, where you had women literally coming in, and within, you have to do, you have to make the decision to take the baby out, otherwise you will lose both, and we were able to do those. Dania, mm -hmm. Dania, what I, we'd just sort of give the specifics to that, because mm -hmm. you mentioned what your husband did just before we went live, so what was he faced with? He uh, essentially did about 14 emergency C-sections in three days, and they were all critical situations where, as um, Humam said, either the mother or the child would have died, and these are women, mothers, who had no other options for health care, and each situation, one was worse than the next. It was heartbreaking. He said, you know, he wished he could have stayed longer. There were people lined up in the waiting rooms, in the front steps of the hospital, in the parking lots. There were hundreds that couldn't be seen. Yes, we had they had to turn away. We had people who, we went into the hospital and we found people sleeping in the steps of the hospital, mm -hmm. waiting for the next day to be They done. knew you were coming. Mm -hmm. Did you know specific cases before you went? No. It we was just all arrived and figured Again, out. It's all Facebook. It's Facebook and WhatsApp where they text each other and they say we have surgical team. So everybody showed up and they, we had people we were able to see in the camps and schedule their surgeries. Those people left the camp after a special permit get granted to them. And they went in and they literally slept for 24 hours on the steps until the next day they were able to get their turn. And, and that's okay. heartbreaking. I have to take a break right now, but stay right there. We're just mm -hmm. gonna continue this. Uh, stay tuned. When we return, dreams still survive in the refugee camps, but for how long? What's the future? لك حكيك عن الدريم تبعي او الحلم تبعي حلمي كمان يعني ب 13 سنه وكنت من عمري كنت حاب اشوف لوس انجلوس لانه كثير كنت اسمع عنها بالافلام و... او بالمسلسلات اسمع عنها حتى قرات عنها مره انه مناطق حلوه و... وكان في لنا جيران بسوريا نص منهم طلعوا على باريس ونص ثاني طلع امريكا ويوم رجعوا انا بحد ذاتي يعني ما عرفت ليش من تعليمهم وثقافتهم بتمنى اطلع هيك شيء بلد غربي أمريكا حصلنا أول مرة على ألمانيا مشان أشوف أهلي وناسي بس إذا بطلع أمريكا مشان أشوفكم وكمل دراسة هناك مشان مثل ما تعرفون اختصاص بالطب. Welcome back. This morning I'm joined by three people who have recently returned from a humanitarian medical mission trip to uh, several Syrian refugee camps in uh, Jordan. Dania Karam, Karam is a local financial advisor, Dr. Humam. Akbik is an anesthesiologist and pain specialist and the founder of Atlantic Human Humanitarian uh, Services uh, Relief and a frequent traveler to the camps. And his son, Hadi, uh, is a senior at Moeller High School and the producer of the video clips that we are using. The entire video can be found on YouTube under the title People of Syria. And please go ahead and watch that because it's, it's well worth it. Who was that young man who was talking about his dreams? And <laughs> um, so that, uh, that boy's name was Arab. Uh, he's my age, he's 17. Um, he, so he's been living in the camp uh, for about four years, I believe, now. Um, so yeah, the, we, when we first got to uh, Razatari camp, he immediately caught me and my friend's eye. Um, because he was like, you guys want to go play soccer? You guys want to go play soccer? So we went and played he soccer. He looks like he him. has certain style, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he had the most attitude out of any kid I met. Uh, he, was, he was great. So we met with him, and then we were like, so you're 17 just like us? He was like, yeah. So then we just sat down and talked, and I, and I was like, this kid, he has a story to tell. And I wanted him to kind of be like the face of what I was trying to create there. Then. You know, I sat down with him and trying to edit that clip was, it took me a while because it, I mean, he, he was my age and what he was telling me about, you know, his life, how he, how, when he left Syria, when he came here and how he had to work, it was just, it was a little much. 
And he wants to be a, what he calls, pediatric doctor, a pediatrician, mm -hmm. which yeah. is interesting to me about he must be watching you. Yeah, and, actually, he, so, uh, and he's watching the people who come and seeing what they're able to do. The question in my mind that I was left with, though, after he was listening to him, was he can still have a dream. How long can this go on mm -hmm. before dreams are really crushed? Uh, because living in that camp, those camps under those conditions, this is, this is unbelievable. When you listen, when you watch the whole video, you'll be able to see what's Arab's story. Arab was, he wanted to be a Hollywood movie star, actually. And then- He might still make it. Well, <laughs> actually, what changed his goals in life, when his two little kids died in his arms after a chemical attack on their village. And the chemical attack happened, his little two kids were not able to survive the his chemicals. Two brothers. two brothers were able to survive the, the, the and when he when they died in his eye, in his in his hands and weren't able to do anything, he said that maybe he can save some other children. That's what changed um, his dreams. The um, hopes can can make goals go on. And as our job as a humans to inject hope into those people's life, because if we stopped injecting their hope, then their life is ended. And they, right now they're hanging by a thread and they live. Mm. But the only thing they can, can live for is the hope that one day this crisis will end and one day they'll be able to go back to normalcy and and does that to mean lives. for most of them going back to Syria? Do they want to go back to that's, Syria? That's everybody you ask, that's their wish, just to go back home. Every kid you ask, they just, they don't want to go. They, they would take their home over a $10 million mansion. It yeah. doesn't matter to them. Yeah. Th there's a misconception that everybody wants to be a refugee, to leave to Europe, to come to the U.S. In the contrary, their only goal right now is to go back home. They want to rebuild their homes. They want to rebuild their life. What is, what did you see, what did you hear was the reaction or the attitude towards the United States right now? Because we have been very, <coughs> compared to Europe, we have been very closed mm -hmm. to refugees coming from Syria. What were you hearing about the United States? I have to turn to you. I, I didn't personally hear anything. Um, and maybe there's nothing. I was yeah. people, with kids. people there, and, and I'll let Hadi also comment a little bit. But people there, when you talk to them, they would like to to bring to the attention of the United States um, residents that there is absolutely no hard feelings from the Syrian people towards the Syria toward the American people. It's just what they want them to understand that none of them wants to be a refugee. All of them wants to go back home. And they lived and they saw on TV and all their life living that America stands for freedom and justice. And they want the Americans to step up and stand up for their freedom and their justice. And they want the, the American people to help them to serve the justice and to live free in their own home. That's all they want. So it's not about being a refugee. It's just about stand up to what we've been promoting all our lives as Americans and now go and help other people achieve their freedom and justice. Hattie, this is a big question. How do you think this is going to affect how you think about your life and what you want to do, this experience? Well, I mean, it's a cliche, but it definitely humbled me, you know? Um, um, like, I, I get to go to a private school. I get to drive my own car. Um, I get to have air conditioning in a house, my own room, my own computer. So, like, when I went there and I, and I met with Arab, and he told me that um, he used to have blue eyes, and his eyes turned bloodshot red from working in the fields all day during Ramadan. It, like, it made me just, you know, want to stay with him and work with him because I don't, it was it was really hard for me to like see that I'm this lucky and how I used to always complain and it and it said a lot but <laughs> it's it's really true. Yeah, yeah. These sorts of experiences can change everybody's lives no matter what age they are. So I'm almost out of time. I understand that one's for me. Yep. Very good. <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> Two of them. Just to, to great. Color. Thank you. you.
Uh, I want to make sure people know how to find about, about your organization. If you'd like to learn more or support the work of the Atlantic Humanitarian Relief, go to the website, www.AtlanticHumanitarianRelief, pretty straightforward, .org, and you'll find out a lot more information about the organization as well. Uh, thank you for everything you are doing on an ongoing basis and for the inspiration that you bring back here to all of us. Thank you for hosting thank us. Thank you, thank you for thank you so all your efforts. Okay. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We end this morning with a statement from one of the people interviewed by Hadi. <laughs> يعني مو مو كل الناس تستمع هون لنا واذا استمعوا ما بيردوا ولا هم معبرين او شيء فاذا تسمعوني فشكرا لكم لاستماعي انا بشكركم بالاصل لانه